Praise the Lord. Well, good evening. Good evening. Thank God for another beautiful evening, another wonderful day. We thank God for His joy that is our strength. And His strength is consistently and continuously strengthening us so that we are able to live triumphantly. And we thank God that it is for freedom that Jesus Christ came and he gave us freedom and now we can profess that we are free and we are to act free because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or there is freedom. And therefore, I'd like to welcome you this evening, those who are watching us online, just want to say thank you for taking your time to be able to join us in this evening Bible study. And uh, I believe you're going to have a good time. Uh, Anytime you come into the presence of God and you are actually going through the gospel, it will always be good because the gospel is always a good news and I can tell you without a doubt that it's going to be good. You like it, I will like it and so thank you for joining us. And if you're joining us for the very first time, you've never been with us before, uh, please let us know. Uh, You can simply say I'm here for the first time uh, when you're responding to Facebook and we'll be able to stay in uh, touch with you and be able to uh, pray with you and encourage you to live the life that God has called you to. And uh, I would like to encourage one another. Let's continue to pray for one another. Let's continue to check on one another, and let's continue to share the Word of God as we are supposed to. And then also I'd like to let you know that on June 14th, you'll be able to get, actually you'll be able to send out a a flyer, uh, not a flyer out, but uh, something out online to let you know that on the 14th of June, We'll be having Reverend Phil uh, with us, Phil Privet. He will be with us on that June 14th. And so we're looking forward for you being able to join and be part of what God will be doing amongst us. And uh, other than that, I just want to let you know that we're praying for you. We're believing God that uh, we will continue to soar up with wings like the eagles and uh, continue to live triumphantly. So this evening, let's get into the word of God and see what Holy Spirit will unveil to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful evening you've given to us. We thank you for the life of Christ that, Lord, you have given to us. And now in him we live, we move, and have our being. And this evening, Lord, I thank you for each and every single individual that is watching and every single individual that is listening, that, Father, Lord, together we are well able to understand as Holy Spirit is giving us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. You are enlightening the eyes of our understanding and you're bringing us to a place where we know and we understand Christ being the hope of glory inside of us and we get to understand why Jesus Christ gave himself for us. Now, Lord, I thank you for divining intervention. Thank you for quickening up our understanding and enabling us to walk in divine health and healing. And Father, Lord, I would like to pray for those who are not feeling well this evening in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I send forth the word of God and I declare that it will heal you and it will deliver you from every destruction. I pray that the anointing of the living God will destroy every yoke and will remove every burden and your body will be quickened up. Every cell, every ligament, every tissue, every organ will be brought back to life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father Lord, we thank you that we are recipients of health and divine living in our bodies in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. Well, we thank God. Let's uh, get into the Bible and uh, discuss a little bit of how we ought to live. Well, last week I just shared with you on uh, the parable of the sower, four different grounds. And all these different grounds, actually, they produced differently. The seed was the same, but the ground was different. And then today I would like to share with you in line of pressing on. You have to keep on pressing on as a a child of God. And you know, you've got to realize that if you don't watch yourself, the ground that you might be ending up being is the one that has thorns with it. For a believer, it is easier for you to say, I am out of the stony ground, whereby I'm not just rejoicing, temporarily, then after that, you don't see me anymore. For most of the believers, you'll see them, they are consistent, they are persistent, they read the word of God, they hear the word of God, 
But then the question comes into place, are you really seeing the effects of the word of God in your life? And if you do not see the effects of the word of God in your life, then it means that there is something there that is competing with the word of God that you are consistently listening to. And that is the ground that had thorns in it. And the Bible says the thorns choked up the word and the word did not produce. So if you're not seeing the effects of the word of God in your life, then you've got to do one thing. You've got to examine yourself. And as you examine yourself, the Bible says, examine yourself to see whether you're standing, whether you're in the faith. You can turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we'll be able to go that about examining yourself. And you've got to understand that the word of God, it lives, it abides, and it endures forever. In other words, the word of God can never die. But the Bible says we've been born of the word of God, which is incorruptible seed, the word that abides and endures forever. And then we understand that every seed produces after its kind. If you plant an orange seed, you'll always receive an orange tree which will produce oranges. If you have planted an apple seed, you'll always receive an apple tree which will produce apples. And so every seed will produce after its kind, and the word of God is supposed to produce after its kind. And therefore, you've got to understand that the seed itself has potential or the capacity or the capability to produce, but the soil will determine whether that seed will be productive or not. But the seed in itself has the potential. In other words, it has a promise of what it can be, but it is just waiting for the right environment. If it does not see the right environment, then the seed will remain dormant. It will still remain in its potential state, but you'll never see its full capacity. Therefore, if we have been born of the word of God, the seed that abides and endures forever, then we've got to understand one thing. The seed, which is the word of God inside of us, has to produce after its kind. And now, what kind of seeds or productivity do I have to see in my life? Hearing the word of God. Well, the first of all, you've got to understand that the word of God talks about healing. The Bible says, my son, attend to my words. Incline your ears unto my saying. Let them not depart from your eyes, but keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Therefore, when you begin to hear the word of God, then it means that the seed, which is the word of God that is of healing, begins to get inside of you. And the more that word gets inside of you, then I ought to see health and healing in my body. If I don't see health and healing in my body, then the first thing I need to do is I need to examine myself. I need to watch and see, yes, I'm receiving that word. The word is supposed to produce, but if it is not producing, then there's something possibly that is choking that word and hindering that word from producing. Therefore, I have to examine myself. And that is where we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And verses 5, the New King James Version says, Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know, or do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? In other words, the testing you need to be doing, you need to be doing it to yourself. Nobody else needs to test and see if you are in faith or not. You test yourself and see whether you are in faith or not. The Amplified Version says, test yourselves and find out if you are really and truly to your faith or if you are really and true to your faith. Now, one of the things I would like to bring to you is anytime an exam is given or anytime a test is given, we tend to panic because it's an exam or it's a test. But have you ever sat down and thought about it, that, you know, they'll never give you an exam or a test of what they've never taught you? Now, when you go through school, when they tell you a test is coming, we tend to panic, or oh, a test is coming, a test is coming. And you're, you're concerned to the point that some people are so much anxious to the point that they cannot perform well because of anxiety. But if you look at it, they'll never ask you anything that they've never shown you. So when it comes to tests and exams, it is simply to prove that you know what you've been taught. So here Paul is saying, test yourselves or examine yourself and find out if you are really true in your faith. 
which means you have to take that test yourself. Nobody is to test you. He's saying you yourself, test yourself and see. So you have to test yourself. Now, how do you test yourself and see if you are in faith? Now, you've got to understand if you're going to test yourself, he's saying you see if you will pass, and if you'll pass, you'll discover that Christ is living in you. So you've been given the answer to this exam. You test yourself in faith and see if you're there. And if you're there, you will discover that Christ is actually living inside of you. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is the anointed one and his anointing. So as long as you pass this test, you'll always realize that the anointed one and his anointing is inside of you. So then how do you do this test and how do you pass this test? Well, the first thing you've got to understand that this is not a one-time test. I didn't check myself this morning. If I woke up and I was tired and I just say, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And then I, 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 I sang myself happy. I talked myself happy. Just like Paul says when he was standing uh, before King Agrippa, that I think myself happy. Therefore, I begin to speak myself and I pass the test and now I'm strong. I'm done. I'll always be strong. No, you will not always be strong. You will always pass that test by telling yourself, I am strong in the Lord. Why? Because in his presence there is fullness of joy. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. And therefore I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Which means I can do all things through the anointed one and his anointing that is inside of me. And the more I focus on that anointing, that anointing is strengthening me to be strong. Even though I am weak, I will say I am strong. Why? Because the moment I say I believe I am strong in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am agreeing with the power of God that is inside of me, and then that power now begins to strengthen me because I am testing myself to be in the faith, and I'm not moved by what I see, nor moved by how I feel, or not moved by what is inside in front of me I am only moved by what I believe that the greater one indwells me he is living inside of me he puts me over he is strengthening me he is giving me the opportunity and the empowerment for me to be able to go above all things and as I do that guess what I find myself strong why because I gave myself the test to see whether I am in faith and I passed the test because I knew that the anointed one is inside of me but then it goes on to say this, but if Christ isn't living in you, you have failed. So even though I say I know I am strong, and five minutes later I say I don't know about this because I've confessed the word and I'm still not making it. It means you have failed the test to realize that Christ is inside of you. Ephesians 3.20 says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you speak or think according to the power that is at work in you, which means you have to consistently be aware of the power that is at work inside of you because that power that is at, inside of you, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all. Therefore, if you are going to test yourself, you have to test yourself, and this test will all, always give you an evidence, and the evidence is Christ in me, the hope of glory. The anointing inside of me is actually empowering me to be able to rise above all kinds of challenges. Now, one of, the, one of the ways you can really see if you are in faith is to examine yourself with the word. Let me give you an example in Ephesians chapter 3. One of the ways to pass this test is to examine yourself and see if you are in the word. In Ephesians chapter 3, Actually, I'm going to zero in verses 17, but I want to read from verses 14 so that you can see what it's saying. In verses 14, it says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is Paul saying, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in your inner man. So here Paul is saying, he's praying to the Father, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory for you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in your inner man. Now you understand that the spirit of God is inside of you. So Paul is saying, I pray that God will continuously strengthen you with his spirit in your inner man. In other words, in your spiritual man. 
So therefore, if you are going to live triumphantly and pass the test of faith as you examine yourself, you have to be aware that the power of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit himself is inside of me and is strengthening me all the time. Then he says in verse 17, what is the purpose of you being strengthened with might through his Spirit in your inner man? Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So in other words, you are being strengthened so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And what is the purpose of him dwelling in your heart through faith so that you may be rooted and grounded in love. In other words, now one way to tell whether you are passing the test of faith is to check your love walk. Because the reason why I'm being strengthened in my inner man by his spirit is so that I could be rooted and grounded in love or stand firm in love. So therefore, if I find myself not walking in love, living in love, then I have to go back and check myself in this test of faith and say, am I really passing this test? Because I ought to walk in love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Do I consistently complain about people's downfalls and whatever they do? If yes, then I have failed because I've not realized that Christ lives inside of me. Because whoever is walking in love, think of the best of the other person. They do not pull the other person down. They do not gossip. They do not murmur. But they pray for the other individual. They hope the best of the other individual. They lift the other individual up. And as a matter of fact, you realize this. If you are used to complaining about people, and then you don't want to do it, and you ask God to help you, he'll ask you to pray for them. Do you know the people whom you pray for you love? So you see, it helps you stay in faith and realize you're passing the test of faith. So I'm examining myself. How is my love work? How am I responding to people? God, help me. Then he'll strengthen you with might in your inner man. And then the, as you're being strengthened in your inner man, you realize this, that you're being rooted and grounded in love, whereby you see something, you hear some words, and you're like, mm, I'm not going to go there. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is reminding you that, hey, don't even go over there if you're going to walk in love. Why? Because love covers a multitude of truth, uh, a multitude of sin. But you may not understand it because if someone is really doing something wrong to me, I'm speaking the truth. Yes, you're speaking the truth, but the Bible says speaking the truth in love. Now, we've got to understand if you're speaking the truth in love, we've got to check it with the scriptures. What does Philippians 4 say? Whatever things are true, is it true that they're doing that or saying that? Oh, absolutely, it's true. Is it noble? Mm, I don't know if it is noble. Is it praiseworthy? No, it is not. Then don't do that. You see, now you're checking it with the word of God. So you are checking to examine to see if you're in the faith. Yes, it is not praiseworthy, even though it is true, but it is not praiseworthy. So I refuse to say it. You see, when you do that, you're being strengthened by the Holy Spirit to do what? To be able to live the life of Christ, so now you are examining yourself. And you see, this is what is causing you to press on. I'm pressing on in the life that I've already been brought into. Therefore, I am not allowing other things to choke up the word of God that is inside of me. I begin to see productivity coming up in my life. And one of the areas that I see as mostly coming short of as believers is we are failing in our prayer life. And when I say about that, it's because... Believers pray, and I'm not going to say that, you know, somebody who's praying for a half an hour is better off than somebody who's praying, praying for five minutes. No, prayer is prayer, and it is based out of your heart, not based out of your time. Now, you've got to understand that when you begin to pray, the Bible tells us when you pray, if you have ought against anyone, you need to forgive them. And so a lot of us pray, yes, but some of us still hold something against someone. And you realize even though you are praying, you're not seeing the results of your prayer. You see, you need to stop right over there and check. There is a thorn that is actually choking up this. Because the Bible says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And James 5.16 says this, that the tremendous power of the righteous man makes power available to make a difference. Which means you and I, when we begin to pray, there is a power that is being released. What power? The anointed power of the Holy Spirit inside of us releases tremendous power to make an effect. But the reason why it is being hindered, because I'm still holding an ought against someone else. So the first thing I need to check is like, hey, wait a minute. 
In this garden, what is growing? There is a thorn over there. I don't want that. Uproot that thorn, throw it out, and allow the word of God to grow so that it can be able to produce. So that is how one of the ways you need to be able to examine yourself and see if you are walking in faith. Now turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. So as we are examining ourselves to see whether we are in faith, then we need to be aware of our lives. Take an inventory of your life and see where am I. If I'm in the same place I was last year, begin to question yourself. How come my life has not changed from where it was last year? And you know what? Nobody can give you the test of faith but you. So you give yourself that test of faith and say, you know what? I realized I never used to pray, but now I am praying. Well, you see, you've given yourself that test of faith. Now, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 14, Paul is saying, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The Amplified Version says, I run towards the goal so I can win the prize of being called to heaven this is the price God offers because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. Now that one verse alone tells you or gives you an understanding that there is opposition. Why is there an opposition? Because he says, I press. You see, when you begin to press on something, it means that there is an opposition. And actually the Greek definition for that is actually you are running with an aim to receive something. In other words, there is something that, you, that is trying to resist you from doing whatever you're doing. So therefore, Paul is saying, I'm going to apply some pressure. Why? Because there is some opposition coming against me. Then you've got to understand also that there is a goal. He says, I press towards the goal. So then the opposition that is trying to come is hindering me from reaching the goal. There is a goal I ought to reach as a believer, but there is some opposition that is hindering me from reaching that goal. And then he's saying that that goal that I'm, 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 I'm supposed to reach, it's because of the call of God. So there is also a call of God that is calling me to go towards my goal. And therefore, I have to press based on the call I have to go over there. And then there is a reward. So if I press and do not give up, there is a reward for me. And therefore, we've got to understand that if we are going to apply pressure, it means that you have an adversary, you have an enemy that is trying to hinder you from reaching your goal. And the adversary is the devil. The Bible says in 1, uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, that you do have an adversary, the devil, who goes around like a roaring lion. What is he doing? He is pressing on so that you may not press through to your goal. So he's constantly pressing on you. Don't pray. Don't read your word. Don't forgive. Whatever they've done to you is worse. You will never make it. You know. So as long as he presses and you allow him to press on you, you are going to be pressed to the wall and you'll realize you can do anything. But understand one thing. Paul just told us, examine yourself to see whether you are in faith. In other words, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth inside of me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you understand that it's no longer my faith, but it's the faith of God inside of me. I have an assurance, I have a confidence towards what he has done for me. And therefore, as long as I put my trust in him, Christ in me, the hope of glory, then he's going to do the work. But if I do not examine myself based on Christ being inside of me, guess what? I will allow the adversary to push me, and the more he pushes me, the more I lose sight of my goal. Because Paul says, I press towards the goal. You know, this goal is Christ. Because if you read that verse, it says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Therefore, the goal here is in Christ. And if you understand that the goal is in Christ, then I have to be familiar with in Christ. Now, in Christ is a place. And it is a place you need to be familiar with. All believers need to be familiar with in Christ. And this place of in Christ is a place where you don't bring your influence. 
but this place influences you. Because when you come in Christ and he influences you, then your attitude changes. You begin to make statements like, I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. But before you realize you're in Christ, you'll come to this place and say, well, I don't know if I'll ever make it. Hopefully something good happens. You see, you're trying to come with your influence in this place, and this place tells you, no, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. In other words, in Christ, that is your goal, that is your aim, that is your focus, and you have to consistently press towards that because your adversary is also pressing on for you not to understand that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. So therefore, he will use his agents, and his agents sometimes tend to be believers or non-believers who will try to say something that is contrary to who you are, which if you don't understand who you are in Christ, you don't understand in Christ, then you'll buy into what they tell you to be. That's why when someone says you are stupid, don't be afraid and don't lose yourself. Why? Because in Christ there is no fool. But if you're not putting your focus on in Christ, someone says you're stupid, they say what? What did he just call me? (laughs) Are you in Christ or are you out of Christ? Out of Christ, they can call you anything. But in Christ, whatever you call does not matter because the influence is coming from this place which is in Christ. And the influence that I'm getting in this place, the Bible says that God uses the foolishness of the world to confine the wisdom of the world. In other words, those people who look like foolish, yeah, you think I'm a fool? Great. Now look, God is going to walk through me and you'll think I'm so wise. Because I'm in Christ. So I'm pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. So this place, I'm receiving the influence of it. And we have to be familiar with this place. Now let me just take you through a few verses over here to remind you actually what this place is and what he's doing in us. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verses 28. So in Christ is a place, and verses 28 says this, for in him, in who? In Christ. So this is a place that now I am in. And now in this place, I live, I move, and have my being. It is in this place. Therefore, you begin to understand, because I am in this place, my functioning comes from it. Another translation says, it is through him that we live and function and have our identity. In other words, when I come into this place, I begin to understand that the influence of in Christ is, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, now it begins to influence me with its place of influence. Well, out of Christ, you are a sinner, you will always be a sinner, and there is nothing you can do about it. In Christ... I am not a sinner, I was a sinner, but now I am no longer a sinner. I have a good place with God, and I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, once you understand that, then now my focus begins to come. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because I am in Christ, and in Christ, this is how I begin to operate, and I begin to move based on this place that I am in. Therefore, it is in this place that now I begin to find my identity, and I begin to find my way of living. So you understand that now my influence is from in Christ and not out of Christ. Therefore, as a believer, I constantly examine myself. And as I'm examining myself and I get myself getting out of Christ, I have to check and say, wait a minute, the greater one is inside of me. I'm living based on my spiritual place, and the spiritual place says I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and the righteousness, when they are in authority, the city rejoices. And therefore, everywhere I go, people ought to be rejoicing because the righteous one has already appeared because I'm in Christ. And so what do I do? I begin to think myself happy. You go to work, Think yourself happy. Why? Because the righteous one in Christ has shown up. And when the righteous are in authority, the city rejoices, the people rejoice. So everybody's going to rejoice today. Well, you're not going to make me. I'm not going to make you, but you won't help it, but you're going to make it through smiling and through having a good attitude. Why? Because the righteousness, one of God, is right here. 
And so when you begin to see yourself that way, you begin to see things are beginning to change. Therefore, because I'm in Christ, I live and move because his influence is inside of me. And if I leave that focus, that is my goal, because Paul is saying, I press towards the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ. Therefore, the goal here is in Christ. You have to be familiar with in Christ. Let me give you another one. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. It says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. In other words, you are a new species. You have the life of God. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You have the life of God. You have the nature of God and you have the ability of God. Think about that. Every time you walk, you have that in your mind. That is your focus. I have the nature of God. I have the ability of God. I have the life of God because I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. In other words, when I come to this place, I am influenced with the life of God, the nature of God, and the ability of God. And when I begin to think of that, now you ask, you ask yourself, if someone tells you you won't make it, think of yourself, if the nature of God is influencing me, how am I not going to make it? Amen. How am I not going to make it? The only way I'll say I won't make it is if I lose my focus of the goal, which is in Christ, then I'll say that, yeah, I may not make it. Well, if someone in Christ is not making it, and you are in Christ, how can you not make it? See, there has to be a distinction between you and the one who is not in Christ. Now, because you are being influenced with this place, you've got to understand that the Bible says we have been delivered from the powers of darkness, which means your spiritual life before in Christ was in darkness. But now that you've been brought in Christ, now you've been brought in light because the Bible says you were once in darkness, but now you are in light, therefore walk as the children of light. In, that is Ephesians 5.8. So now you have to make yourself walk in light. How am I going to walk in light? Because you're already in light. You have been delivered from the powers of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son, which is the kingdom of light. And because I am in light, what is happening? I'm going to walk in light. By faith, I know I'm walking in light. But you don't look like it, no? Don't be moved by what you see. Because what you see is subject to change. What you do not see is eternal. What you see is only temporary. You might see me in darkness, but actually God is seeing me in light. And then you know what? God calls those things that be not as though they are. See, in the, in the, in, in the beginning when God was creating, there was, the Bible says that uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then he says that and darkness hovered over the surface of the, the earth. And then what did God say? Isn't it interesting? He never said, oh my goodness, look at how dark it is out there. We need some light. See, he called what he wanted. He spoke the answer. And therefore, when you are in Christ, you speak the answer, don't speak the problem. Because you have been brought to a place where there is an answer. And as long as you speak the answer, then you are putting the word of God into motion. And the word begins to become a reality to you. That's why when you examine yourself and you don't see the results... Check what you've been saying. Have you been saying what you don't desire or have you been saying what you desire? That's why the Bible says in, in, in Mark, Mark chapter 11 verses 24 that whatsoever, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. But when you begin to go and say like, you know, I don't think I can make it. It will be the most challenging time in my life. I don't know what's going to go through. Let's just pray. Don't go pray. Go build yourself up in faith. Go find what the Bible says about your situation. Find your place in Christ and then now go pray. Because when you went to prayer, you went to prayer with doubt and unbelief and then you're expecting God to do something. No, you need to go to God in faith because it is impossible to please him without faith. But he has brought you to a place where you can operate in faith by simply saying, yes, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Anything that I see is subject to change. Therefore, the tremendous power of the righteous man when he prays he releases a, a power that is able to make things happen. Amen. So you and I have got a responsibility to constantly keep our focus where God wants us to do. So the old life was in darkness. Now, do you understand 
that actually Satan is the God of this world. But he likes to operate in darkness. So God brought you out of his place of domain and brought you into the place of his dear son, which is the domain of light. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that Satan, the God of this world, blinds the minds of many so, or the people who do not believe so that they do not see the light of the glorious gospel and believe. So his main agenda, remember, he is your adversary. That's why you have to keep on pressing. He likes to operate from the dark. But when you've been brought into the light and you keep on walking in the light, then he has no way that he could be able to operate in darkness to cause you not to win. Therefore, you understand that your adversary operates in darkness. He likes darkness, but we will not operate in darkness because we understand who we are. Therefore, if you are in Christ, you have the ability of God, you have the nature of God, you are being influenced with the nature and the ability of God, and therefore you win. Amen. If you come down to verses 21 of the same, same chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he says, him who knew no sin was made to be, uh, him who knew no sin was made to be seen for us that we might be made to know the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, we never knew what righteousness was when we were in darkness. But when Christ was made to be seen for us, then he made us to know righteousness through his crucifixion on the cross. And therefore now we can say we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And as a result of that, I can say I have a good position with God. Why? Because I've been brought to a place, and this place is in Christ. And as long as I press on towards being right with God, <clears throat> then I can receive the promises of God. <clears throat> so therefore, we've got to understand that this place in Christ is a place that helps us to be able to understand how we can rule and we can be able to win. Now, have you ever understand... Have you ever understood, I mean, from Romans chapter 8, verses 1, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Ask yourself, when are you not in condemnation? In Christ. And when is that? All the time. And if it is all the time, then don't accept any kind of condemnation because that is coming from the enemy. Because I have to be familiar with this in Christ place. Because if I'm not familiar with this in Christ place, guess what? Philippians 3.14 will not make sense for me because I press towards the mark of the high pricing of call in God, uh, in Christ Jesus. Therefore, in order for me to press, I understand I have an opposition and this opposition is trying to hinder me from focusing on the goal and the goal is in Christ and therefore I do not need to be condemned. Why? Because I'm in Christ and in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation. And that is all the time when, right now, I am not condemned. Because I'm in Christ. And if you understand that you're in Christ and there is no condemnation, then you've got to understand that the reason why there is no condemnation is because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Where? In Christ. In Christ, the law of the spirit of life. I have the spirit of life. When? Right now. Am I going to be condemned? No, because I'm in Christ. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Right now, I am in Christ. This place of influence, his spirit has set me free from the law of sin and death, which is operating in the spirit of darkness. And therefore, if I will learn to endure, to press towards the goal, I will always obtain the prize of God's upward call. Amen. But if I do not endure in pressing, then I will not receive the reward. So let's go back again to that Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And it just said, I press towards the goal. So there is opposition, and there is a mark or the goal. And that goal is in Christ. And there is a prize of that call. Now, what is the call? Because if you don't understand your call either, You'll be able to give up. Now, when he's talking about the call over here, he's not talking about a ministry call. He's talking about you being called as a child of God. You understand that now you've been called into the sonship of God. And therefore, once we understand our call, 
you've got to understand that this call that we have, we are able to walk it and be able to live successfully and effectively. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9, he says, but you are a chosen generation. Who is that? You are a chosen generation. You need to know that God has chosen you. In other words, he has handpicked you. Now, I'd like to paint a picture for you to understand how important you are before God. When I was in school, in order for you to make it to the school team, either in basketball or in soccer or in field hockey or in volleyball, you had to be picked by the teacher. If the teacher picks you, it means you have all the capabilities of playing for the school and representing the school well. And now God chose you. In other words, God saw you and God handpicked you because he saw the potential that is in you to be able to represent the heavenly kingdom well and be able to have heaven on earth. So you look at yourself and say, you know what, I am that much important because God had picked me. I made it on the team. And if you made it on the team, then you've got to understand that you have been chosen and you've been chosen for your generation. And then it goes on to say, you are a royal priesthood. In other words, you're not just a priest, but you are a kingly priest. And then it goes on to say, you are a holy nation. His own special people. Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who did what? Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, the reason why you made it to God's team is because he picked you out of darkness. Amen. And as long as you are out of darkness, you are in the team. But you can get yourself back into darkness if you begin to fellowship with darkness. And you will be able to see how it is easy to fellowship with darkness even without you realizing. And therefore, Paul reminds us, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Because if you're going to press on towards the prize of the high calling of God, you have to consistently examine yourself. And you examine yourself in Christ. And as long as you examine yourself in Christ, you understand that I have a special call of God in my life. And the call of God that I have in my life is helping me do what? Helping me do one thing is to present him well. The Amplified Version says, But you are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings, a spiritual nation, set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you will broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. In other words, the calling of God upon your life is to be experienced and it is to be displayed. So you can experience God's marvelous work so that you can display the works of his hands. That's why Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's workmanship. We are his handiwork. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to show God's handwork, whatever he has done, through our life of faith in him. And as long as we understand we are in Christ, we are examining ourselves in Christ, what are we doing? We are experiencing in Christ, and then we are displaying Christ in us. And that's why God called us to be able to do that. So we are a chosen generation. We are called out of darkness and be able to display his marvelous light. Now you've got to understand, even though we are doing that, we've got to realize that we still have to interact with other people who are in darkness. But then you've got to understand that the Bible says we have loyalty to Christ even though we are with the people who are in darkness. That's why the Bible says in, in I think it is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you begin to read it, it says, what has got light to do with darkness? What has got righteousness got to do with unrighteousness? Do not be unequally yoked. In other words, he's saying that, you know what, even though you are amongst the people who are in darkness, you still have your loyalty towards me. In other words, don't let darkness suck you in darkness that you forget your loyalty towards Christ. And therefore, we choose to dwell in Christ, we choose to stay in Christ, and be able to walk in light. Now, 
I mentioned that if we don't examine ourselves, it is easy for us to forget sometimes that we are walking in light and even fellowship with darkness. And now let me begin to get to break some things for you to see how we can examine ourselves fully and get out of this. In 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And in verse 7, John is saying, Brethren, I write, I write no new commandment to you. In other words, he's talking to believers. I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. And that commandment was, love one another just as Christ loved you. So he goes on to say this. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Verses 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. In other words, this commandment you received, you received it in him, and now that, that commandment you received in him has put you in light. Then verses 9, he says, he who says he is in, in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now you think about that, he's talking about believers. He's saying you have the commandment which you had from the beginning I do not need to remind you of it, but you know it. You need to love one another just as Christ loved you. Then he goes on to say, if you are in this light, in this commandment, that you are in light, but if you hate your brother, then you are in darkness. Well, who is operating in darkness? Satan is operating in darkness. Why? Because he is the God of this world and is blinding the minds of many so that they do not see the light of the glorious gospel. So you can't be in Christ and if you do not focus in Christ, you will get into darkness and you will be influenced by demonic forces. And that comes as a result of hating. So as a believer, you need to examine yourself and say, I do not dislike my brother. I do not dislike my sister. It's amazing, even right now, in this situation where we are in, churches are opening back, and just what believers are saying to other believers, you just wonder, are we all in Christ, or are some of us in Christ, and some of us want to get in Christ? But you see, when we get that, we begin to do what? We begin to dislike our brothers and sisters. Why are you disliking? You are being influenced with demonic spirits that are operating in darkness. Because the Bible says here that he who says he is in light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. But he's still calling you a brother. He did not say you're not a brother. So you're still a believer, but you're being influenced out of Christ. Because he goes on to say, he who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In other words, you have been so much influenced by evil spirits to the point whereby you really don't understand that you are in Christ. And that comes from just us disliking our fellow brothers. He's not even talking about non-believers, just talking about brothers. And so as believers, we have to examine ourselves and say, why do I dislike the other believer? See, I don't have to go with you in the same local gathering. As long as you are a believer, we are believing the same cause. We are all in Christ. And therefore, I have to believe in you. And I have to pray for you. And I have to encourage you. Why? Because you and I are in Christ. We've all been brought into this place. You see, we are all in America. Whether you are in the south, or you are in the Midwest, or you are in the north, or you are in the east, you are in America. There is nobody who is more an American than the other person. Whether you are in Alabama and I'm in Nebraska, we are all Americans. I won't say I'm more of an American because I'm in Midwest and you're in Alabama, you're less of an American. No, we are all Americans. And therefore, when you come in Christ, we are all brothers. And therefore, I do not need to dislike you. I need to love you. And how do I love you? 
just like Christ loved me. In other words, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame. In other words, Jesus said, there is nothing that is going to hinder me from doing what? From paying the price for you to walk in me, in Christ. And therefore, as a believer, I'm going to stand and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to be a blessing to you. Otherwise, if I don't do so, I'm getting into darkness and I'm being blinded. And guess what? Satan, the God of this world, is blinding the minds of many so that they do not see the light of the glorious gospel. And therefore, you are in darkness. You are stumbling. Yes, you are in faith, but not in faith. You are failing the test because you do not know who is inside of you. And Paul is saying, examine yourself and see whether you are in the faith. Yes, I believe the word. I confess the word. The word of God will work for me. Really, will it work for you? Because there is something that is coming up. And so for believers, we have to understand our influence comes from Christ. And therefore, we always have to examine ourselves. What does the word of God say? If the word of God says this, then I have to operate and follow what the word of God says. And if I follow what the word of God says, then I am abiding in light. And as long as I abide in light, then guess what? I am not blinded. I'm not giving the adversary an opportunity to press on towards me and hinder me from experiencing the reward that I need to experience in Christ. And therefore, this darkness over here begins to become more and more revelationary if you begin to get in it. Because the more you go into it, you realize that the Bible says, test every spirit if it is from God. But I am a believer. I'm in Christ. The Spirit of God is inside of me. I hear the voice of the Spirit. But you're being told, test every spirit because every spirit is not from God. And if every spirit is not from God, every spirit or some spirit can be able to influence you to go against God. And those spirits begin to speak to you and then you come to a point where you realize uh, Timothy was saying, or Paul was telling Timothy in the book of Timothy that in the last days, some will depart from their faith. Why? Because they will be deceived by demonic spirits. And we have to understand that as believers. I can be a believer, but not a believing believer. I can be an unbelieving believer. But we are being told we need to watch ourselves so that we do not become unbelieving believers. But I pray to God that we will not be unbelieving believers. I would like to take you through that 1 John chapter 4. And we just see how he's explaining how these deceiving spirits are deceiving us even without us knowing. But we need to be on guard. We need to watch ourselves. Why? Because if we don't watch ourselves, we will find ourselves in a position whereby we are not able to produce what we need to produce. And in that first John chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. He's not saying that Antichrist is already in the world, but he's saying the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And that spirit is going around and you better be watchful. And how do you know that that spirit is in operation? I am out of time. be able to give it to you next week. But if you've got to understand one of the things, I'll just give you a quick answer to this and show you this. In Christ, living in Christ, I am influenced with that position. So I'll give an example, and I'll pick up this next week. In the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of his dear son, God has said a family consists of a father, a mother, and children, and then this extended family. So in the kingdom of God, parents are a male man and a female man. 
That is the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. The kingdom of darkness is redefining what the kingdom of light has said. And the kingdom of darkness is redefining it and saying, a family could be of the same gender. Now, if you are in Christ and are walking in light, then you will not be blinded and deceived. But if you are blinded and deceived, you'll find yourself and say, yeah, a family could be the same gender. No, a husband and a husband could be a husband and a wife. A wife and a wife could be a husband and a wife. Examine yourself and test every spirit to see whether it is from God. Because this spirit is creeping in and is blinding the eyes of those who are in Christ. And as a result of that, you find yourself saying you are in Christ, but not really in Christ. Because you have been blinded by another spirit, which is not of God. Because the spirit of God has expressly spoken to you that in the last days, some will depart from faith. Why? Because they'll be giving heed to deceiving spirits. And so we have to examine ourselves and make sure that everything we do, I have to check whether I'm in faith. Is Christ dwelling inside of me? And what is the kingdom of Christ saying? What is that influence? Am I bringing my influence in or am, am I being influenced with this? And if we understand that, then there is nothing that will be impossible for us. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen? Amen. And so that is where I will start by next week, this first John chapter 4. And go through how you test this spirit and examine yourself and see whether you are in the faith or not. If you want to see God's kind of results, you have to stay with God. If you don't want to see God's kind of results, then you stay away from God. But you know what? If you are in Christ, then in Him you live, in Him you move, and in Him you have your being. You do not partially live in Him. No, you live in Him because the influence is coming from Him. Glory be to God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we honor you this evening. We thank you for your word that you've sent forth to us. And that, Lord, the entrance of your word is enlightening the eyes of our understanding. Father, we thank you that we'll consistently and continuously examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. And, Father, Lord, because we are in faith, we understand that Christ dwells inside us and we walk in love, speaking the truth. And we thank you that, Lord, this evening you've taught us your word. We embrace your word, we receive your word, and Father, we thank you for enlightening us and enabling us to walk in light as the children of light. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and have a blessed week and looking forward to seeing you on Sunday and God bless you.